Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cyber UK 2022. Please welcome to the stage the NCSC UK Cyber UK Event Director, Della. Bore da. Good morning and welcome to day two of Cyber UK 2022. Just before we start, and as a reminder for any new delegates joining us today, either here or online via YouTube, here are the usual uh, health and safety and general housekeeping announcements. Firstly, for those of you with us online, we have another day with an exciting lineup of speakers. The plenary sessions will be live streamed to you direct from us here at ICC Wales, and they will also be available as on-demand content. There are a range of keynotes and panel sessions, and also some on-demand content from some of our key sponsors. The full agenda can be seen on the Cyber UK website, and we'll also be putting up announcements throughout the day to tell you what's coming up. We welcome your interaction with the sessions, so if you have comments, feedback, or want to reach out to others in the event community, please do so using the YouTube channel comments facility, or connect with us on Twitter, or LinkedIn using the hashtag CyberUK22. Emergency procedures. There are no planned drills today, so all alarms and announcements are to be followed. Follow the direction of the ICC Wales and event staff, and you'll be directed to the nearest exit location. Anyone who needs assistance in an emergency, please make yourselves known to a member of the venue staff. And please, can you all make yourselves aware of the emergency exits as you move around the venue? If first aid treatment is required, please again contact a member of the venue staff who will be able to assist. And COVID is still with us, so please make frequent use of the hand sanitizer stations. You must wear your name badge throughout the event for security reasons. And should you lose your badge, please report back to the registration and you can collect a replacement with appropriate photo ID. You will find all the agenda information on your mini guide and in the digital delegate brochure. And should you need any more help on that, please head to the information desk or look for a member of the events team. They're wearing red t-shirts with a name badge with a purple stripe. Filming and photography. There will be event film crews and official pho photographers roving throughout the event today. And there will also be unescorted members of the media. The media have yellow badges and yellow lanyards. Please ensure that you have a red lanyard if you don't want to be filmed or photographed. Feedback is very important to us. And we'll be using Slido again today um, for some of the live feedback. And there's also information in the mini guide on how to sign on to that. Um, and please post anonymously or with your first name only. And please do not post any sensitive information. Uh, there's a link to our feedback survey in the dele delegate digital brochure. And a reminder will be sent out post-event. There's also staff on site with iPads with a very shortened version for those who are really keen to give us immediate feedback. And the information will be used by the NCSC comms team to evaluate and develop the event. The Code of Conduct. As organizers of this event, the National Cybersecurity Center is dedicated to providing a positive learning and sharing experience for all participants. We are all therefore expected to conduct ourselves appropriately in accordance with the Cyber UK Code of Conduct, which we all signed up to at registration. A copy is available at the event website. Should you have any concerns relating to this, we have a dedicated team here to assist. They can be contacted at any time. Their contact details are available from the NCSC stand and at the information desk. So now, please, can I ask you all to switch your de mobile devices to silent as we're about to start. Hope you have a good day too. Thank you.
please welcome to the stage the CEO of NCSC, Lindy Cameron. Bora, Chriso, and welcome back to Cyber UK. I hope you're all feeling bright and refreshed. So just to wake you up, we're going to do a quick highlights video from yesterday to remind you of what we had yesterday. I think this event is fantastic for the UK. Cyber UK is without doubt the event. Being at Cyber UK as well just shows you how many women in cybersecurity there actually are. So, so far it's been a nothing but an amazing opportunity to be here. Fantastic. So it's really great to see you all back here, um, bright and refreshed. I hope that yesterday's inspirational sessions gave you food for thought and have set you up for our final day, which is packed with um, even more insightful presentations and engaging workshops. And for all of you watching our YouTube channel, thanks for tuning in, and I really hope you can join us in person next year when Cyber UK will be in Belfast. So once again, I'd like to thank our exhibitors and sponsors, particularly Secure Works for the, net for the fantastic networking evening last night, and to our key sponsors, Amazon Web Services and BT, thank you for your enduring support for Cyber UK. So yesterday was a whirlwind of conversation, collaboration, debate ideas, you know, meeting old friends, making new friends, actually catching up in particular for me with people who I've only ever seen in video conferences, including quite a lot of my staff. But the cyber news that made the biggest impact outside of the ICC was the announcement that Russia was behind a cyber attack with a Europe-wide impact an hour before the Ukraine invasion that targeted the commercial communications company Viasat in Ukraine. And the deliberate malevolence of irresponsible cyber actors is partly why it's so important that our community stands together here at events like Cyber UK. I know we are a community that wants to embrace the digital age and allow like-minded people to thrive in the opportunities that it offers to us. And I know the Minister who's going to speak shortly has just been discussing that with some of our key sponsors. The discussions we had yesterday at Cyber UK were a microcosm of the, the whole of society approach that we've been advocating to help defend us from shared threats. So right from the get-go, we heard about global trends in cybersecurity, the implications for our society, set against the, the positive things that can happen when government, academia, and industry collaborate. I spent quite a lot of yesterday talking about the, um, the figures that we released on active cyber defense, crushing more than 2.7 million online scam campaigns, which was a four-fold increase in the previous year. So we do great things when we work together, which is just as well, because the world's changing fast and not always for the better. As we know, there are two general approaches here. One's a, an authoritarian approach to using digital technology to control a population, increasingly adopted by oppressive regimes around the world. And the other approach, which we take, is diametrically opposed to that, aiming to mobilize every individual to stand up for the collective safety of our community. But to do that, we need to empower everyone. We need to give them the tools, the knowledge, the confidence to make good choices, and to make that habitual for everyone. I was lucky enough to, uh, to grow up with a dad who was a bit obsessed by health and safety. Sounds tedious, but hey, bear with me. Um, he was HR director for a large chemical company, and he knew that employees that put their seatbelts on when they were taking their kids to work were much more safety aware and much less likely to stick their hands in a machine or make poor safety decisions at work. So I firmly believe that we need to think of people as, as whole individuals who, whose personal cybersecurity and whose cybersecurity at work aren't something we can separate. We want them to take cybersecurity seriously. But, and it's not a small but, how do we actually achieve that? I think the answer lies in part with education. We need businesses, charities, and government to do more to enlighten their staff, think about the benefits of good cyber hygiene, make sure it's something we talk about regularly. 
Look at the NCSC's recent cyber aware campaign that helped to, people to protect their email accounts. We've worked, for example, with Google to promote two-step verification for all of their users across the whole of the UK. That's a massive step. We've got to make it clear that things like that, you know, as I say, apply to what you do in your personal life as well as what you do in your work life, your personal banking, as much as it applies to the management of your credentials at work. We need to help people develop that instinct for spotting digital duplicity, help them with a simple set of tools and a menu of options for what to do when they receive a dodgy email or a dodgy SMS. And I do hope that, and I'm sure actually, that all of you in this, in this room and listening online already have those instincts. But if you're here, it's not just about you. You are well placed to help everyone else get it. And that's really important, I think, for us to think of as businesses, government, the rest of society, because the threat's not going away. It will change, but it won't, it won't go away. And we must be savvy enough to respond to those changes. So we need to help people help themselves. That way we can build a well-prepared, resilient nation, one that sees the digital world as exciting, vibrant, and rewarding, not scary, confusing, and dull. So if you thought yesterday was busy, um, I'm definitely proposing a day which is not scary, confusing, and dull. It is definitely exciting and entertaining. There's an awful lot on offer. I was really sorry I couldn't make it to the women's uh, networking breakfast this morning. Um, I was at a sponsor's breakfast with CDL, but I saw a room packed with fantastic women talking about cybersecurity, which is really inspiring. We'll hear shortly from the Right Honourable Steve Barclay, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, and we're really delighted that he's joined us here at Cyber UK, fresh from the Queen's speech yesterday. He'll then be followed by Stephen Creed from Amazon Web Services, one of our main sponsors, and Amy Alenka, the Director for Security and Information at the Ministry of Justice. And then it'll be time to introduce a great friend of the NCSC, Jen Easterly, Director of the US's Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency. Unfortunately, Jen is a bit gutted she can't make it here in person this week, but she has sent us a video message instead, and her colleague Brandon Wales, the Executive Director for CISA, um, will join the supply chain panel with Marsha from NCSC in her stead. So thank you to Brandon for standing in. We then give you a quick break to get your caffeine hit. Not that I'm saying you will all need that, but some of you look like you do with it. Um, and then we'll be back on with the Right Honourable Damon Hines, Minister for Security and Borders at the Home Office. So let's get started then. I'm really proud and very grateful to him for coming um, to introduce and welcome to the stage the Right Honourable Steve Barclay, who in addition to his roles as Chief, Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister and Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster in the Cabinet Office, also manages to squeeze in the very significant role of Lead Government Minister for Cybersecurity. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Barclay. Thank you, Lindy. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, across the Cabinet Office in number 10, we see the range of threats that our country faces. And core to our defence is the work of you, Lindy, and colleagues at the National Cyber Security Centre. So firstly, a huge thank you to you, but also those in the room that do so much to keep us safe. And it is these threats that I want to talk about this morning, particularly in the context of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, but also the huge opportunity that cyber in the UK currently presents, including setting out the whole of society approach that is integral to tackling those threats, but also achieving the UK's potential, and indeed building on the comments of Sir Jeremy yesterday. Much progress to protect us from the risk of internet-based attacks has been made since the launch of the UK's first national cyber strategy, with cyber experts thwarting 2.7 million online scams last year alone, more than four times that of 2020. The NCSC has said that it believes that Russia continues to pose a significant and enduring cyber threat to the UK. And yesterday, the UK, along with the EU, the US, and other allies, said that Russia was responsible for a series of cyber attacks mounted since the invasion of Ukraine. Their impact has been felt across Europe in disrupted access to online services and even in the operation of wind farms. And Russia has said that it sees the UK support for Ukraine as unprecedented hostile actions. And as Avril Haines said yesterday, Putin is preparing for a long conflict. So we must all therefore consider the likely long-term threat so that we are as prepared as we possibly can be. 
And the greater cyber threat to the UK, one now deemed severe enough to pose a national security threat, is from ransomware attacks. Should the UK face an attack on the scale previously inflicted on Ukraine's critical national infrastructure sites, businesses and the public should not expect to receive advance warning. Preparedness is therefore essential. And our defences must be in place, ready for whatever comes in whatever way. And this is why the work, Lindy, of the NCSC is so important. And I'm sure many of you here today have had the benefit of their knowledge and free resources. But it's crucial that we spread the word wider. And I was delighted to learn that the NCSC cyber advice for businesses was accessed over 100,000 times after Tony Danker, the Director General of the CBI, and I wrote a piece for the Times. And that 3,000 schools have accessed the NCSC's new cyber defense tools for schools in just the first week after its release. But of course, there's no room for complacency, and every member of the public has their part to play. Every company in a supply chain can make sure they are not the weakest link, because making sure we are ready, as Sir Jeremy said yesterday, is a whole of society effect. And that is one reason why the conference Cyber UK is a calendar highlight, an opportunity to channel the expertise and use as an enterprise across government and business but also a great opportunity to shine a light on the national success story that digital and cyber has become. Thanks to our work together, I am determined that the UK will be the world leader for innovation, gaining a digital education, and indeed having an open, safe, and reliable internet. And this allows us to take full advantage of the broader social and economic opportunities of the digital age, which is at the core of our national cyber strategy. And make no mistake, the record £2.6 billion of government funding is a statement of our intent. As the Prime Minister has said, we want the UK to regain its status as a science superpower and in doing so, to level up. Cyber is key to this mission. It is no accident that we're here today in the heart of Cyber Wales's ecosystem. Having previously met in Glasgow and next year, will be off to Belfast. Evidence of the Union working to benefit the whole of the United Kingdom. And I also note, as many in the room will be aware, that today is the 25th anniversary of the supercomputer Deep Blue beating the chess champion Garry Kasparov in a man versus machine contest that indeed astonished the world. Now back then, Deep Blue was a project costing $100 million. The computer weighed 1.4 tons with two six foot five inch black towers. Now compare that to today, to the mobile phones in our pockets matching it for processing power. Such is the speed of progress, digital technology has already grown to touch every aspect of our lives. Democratizing threats, but also playing an important part in our future growth with the potential for huge economic gains. Look at what the cybersecurity sector alone contributed to the UK economy last year, generating £10.1 billion in revenue, and it attracted more than a billion pounds in investment. Thanks to 6,000 new jobs created, over 52,000 people are now employed in cybersecurity, and I think importantly, more than half of them are outside London and the South East. So as well as Wales, cyber security clusters are flourishing in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, in the North West, and in the East Midlands. But we want to see more startups like the new collaboration between NCSC and the five tech companies to develop low-cost ways to tackle ransomware attacks, which is testimony to the UK being the best place for innovation outside Silicon Valley. As the country builds back from the pandemic, the cyber skills revolution will help fuel growth, equip people to build and switch into new careers, and to stay working where they grew up, spreading opportunity all around the UK. Through our Cyber First Bursary Program, more than 100 students receive £4,000 in eight weeks paid training or development work with government and industry, leading to a full-time role when they graduate. And now those working in cyber 
including indeed people here today, will have the chance to become chartered professionals. As the UK Cyber Security Council has been granted its Royal Charter in recognition of the invaluable work it is doing to raise standards and ensure good career pathways. Of course, investment in business and skills is immensely important to the economy and jobs. But it's also essential to help us preserve the UK's core values of democracy and free speech, as we are doing through our online harms bill. Now, from my conversations with heads of schools, business leaders, chief executives, the message of the need to keep people safe online is indeed landing and it's spreading. With key sectors stepping up to do their bit. In schools, we now have more than 1,500 teachers signed up to deliver our Cyber Explorers program, seeding their enthusiasm in younger students for maintaining a safe and resilient cyberspace. And indeed, I'm looking forward to joining pupils at St. Joseph's School here in Newport to hear their experience of the Cyber First Gills competition. We also have the National Cyber Force, combining the hard and soft power from our military and intelligence services to counter the threats that we face. And government has been working with partners across the sector on legislation in order to help keep us safe online. Indeed, we're protecting consumers by enforcing minimum standards in connected products through the Product Security and Telecommunications Infrastructure Bill so that the Internet of Things doesn't become the Internet of Threats. Telecoms operators that fail to meet security standards will face heavier Ofcom fines under the Telecommunications Security Act. And just yesterday, the Data Reform Bill in the Queen's Speech will ensure that personal data is protected to a higher standard, enabling stronger action against organisations for a breach. Together, this legislation will play a significant role but we also, alongside it, require a global approach. In these uncertain times, international allies are essential in intelligence sharing, shaping the governance of cyberspace, and deterring irresponsible behavior and ensuring cyberspace remains free, open, peaceful, and secure. The road to free and resilient cyberspace runs through our friends in Warsaw and Bucharest all the way to Kiev. And the UK was amongst the first states to set out how the rules-based international order extends to cyberspace. And it's something my colleague, Suela Braverman, the Attorney General, will be saying more about at Chatham House next week. Last year, when I launched the National Cyber Strategy, we said that ransomware had become the most significant cyber threat facing the UK. It is therefore imperative that we continue to prepare for the future and learn from past attacks at home and indeed abroad. We must not drop our guard, underestimate the threat or take our eye off the ball when it comes to our cyber defenses across society. And indeed, in the run-up to the Ukraine invasion, Russia unleashed deliberate and malicious attacks against Ukraine. The Ukrainian financial sector was targeted by distributed denial of service attacks that took websites offline with the UK government declaring the Russian main intelligence director, the GRU, as being involved. Since then, evolving intelligence about Moscow exploring options for cyber attacks prompted last month's joint advisory from the UK and our Five Eyes allies that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could expose organizations within and beyond the region to increased malicious cyber activity. Some UK citizens have already felt the impact of cyber attacks. And some authorities estimate that in 2020, ransomware attacks may have cost the UK economy a minimum of £615 million. Over the past year, the National Crime Agency has received on average one report from victims of a Russian-based group responsible for ransomware attacks in the week. One report a week. And indeed, some authorities have estimated that over the last year, global ransomware payments are up 144%. And the average demand is $2.2 million. But the number of incidents, and indeed their economic cost to the UK, is likely 
to be much higher. Law enforcement teams believe that most attacks go unreported, perhaps through embarrassment or a reluctance to admit that money has indeed changed hands. So I would encourage any organisation that suffers an attack to come forward, report it to Action Fraud, who run our 24-7 cyber reporting line. By doing so, you will help us to strengthen our individual and collective resilience as we learn from each other. In one attack in the UK, the National Crime Agency alerted a public sector organisation to an ongoing breach of its systems. Within hours, the NCA had identified the compromised services, located the exfiltrated data, which it later managed to take down so that no personal information got out. What we learned is that our controls quickly spotted the incidents and our reaction was swift. And we were then able to share useful evidence with industries so that they can learn and prepare for similar attacks. The government is stress testing its own defences too. The more complete our security picture, the better we would handle any attack. And in the context of our most capable adversaries becoming more sophisticated, I can announce that we have agreed support for the next decade of UK cryptographer capabilities, nothing less than the entire ecosystem that keeps government safe, recognising the vital national importance of our sensitive sovereign crypt key technology. Now, computer professionals tell me there is only one surefire way to know a computer is never hacked, never connect to the internet. But let's be realistic, that's not an option. Which is why we have to work together through the NCSC's world-leading tools and advice, through acting with international allies, through legislation, through protecting our own government systems, but most importantly, through harnessing our collective strengths and acting as one, building, as Sir Jeremy set out yesterday, that whole of society response. This is at the heart of the national cyber strategy, treating the cyber domain as no longer being a niche concern simply for the IT team, but as a wide-ranging grand initiative. Being a responsible, durable, effective cyber power cannot be achieved by government alone. So we want to work with industry, universities, schools, and individual citizens getting involved, working together as a whole society. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Enterprise Account Manager for AWS, Stephen Creed, and Director for Security and Information at the Ministry of Justice, Amy Alekna. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stephen Creed. I lead the, uh, the justice sector at Amazon Web Services. Of course, we're proud to be the sponsor of today's keynote speech as well. The justice sector for us covers a, a, a large, complex uh, ecosystem of agencies across the MOJ, which Amy Lettner is going to speak to you about now. Amy is the uh, director of the Information Security Group at MOJ, and I'd like you to join me, please, in welcoming Amy Lettner. Hello everybody. I hope you're having a fun and productive time here in Wales. As Stephen said, I am Amy Alekna. I'm the Director of Security and Information at the Ministry of Justice. I'd like to thank NCSC and AWS as lead sponsors for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. If you were asked to describe a security professional, Somebody might think of a script, kiddie, a script kiddie in a hoodie, maybe a geek, maybe a pale middle-aged man. I asked my son, and he described somebody hiding behind big sunglasses and somebody with a big computer. So this is my dog and my kids masquerading as hackers. 
I do wear big sunglasses and I am middle-aged, but I don't think anybody would describe me. So I'm a woman, I bring some much needed diversity to the security profession and a different perspective to all of the issues we face. So I'm not here to tell you what your job is, but from my experience, it's really important how we do our jobs. I've come to understand that when we make the effort to work together, to not work in silos, to bring greater transparency, that is when we deliver the results that achieve transformational outcomes and better protect our users. It's a bit like a Roman tortoise formation. So if you don't know what that is, it's when the Romans put their shields so closely together that there were no gaps and nothing could penetrate what they were protecting. And I believe that we are stronger and better protect our users when we work together. I'll come back to that thought, but first of all, some context about the environment that I work in. As Stephen said, MOJ is a complex ecosystem. We have over a thousand different IT systems, spread over 80 different technology estates. When we had to respond to the Log4j incident uh, vulnerability recently, we had to seek assurance from over those 80 technology estates, reaching out to multiple suppliers. I am going to need a pretty big Roman tortoise shield. MOJ wants to be innovative. We're giving technology to prisoners in their prison cells. And I have to take a multifaceted approach to security, pushing the limits of cyber, physical, and personnel security risks to help achieve those innovations. Unlike many cybersecurity attacks, we know our threat actors before we've even written the first network diagram. Yet we want to help that innovation. And so it's essential that we stress test our systems, that we spot the vulnerabilities and put the right controls in place before our hackers do. Prisoners have got a lot of time on their hands. Then there are all the common issues that we all face. There have been a lot of conversations about legacy systems over the last couple of days. In the Ministry of Justice, we estimate that 75% of our IT systems are legacy, and most of these are outsourced, so we are heavily reliant on the supply chain for maintaining and fixing those systems when they often go wrong. Three years ago, the Ministry of Justice was on the front page of the Times because the court IT system went down, and that impacted on court hearings. Our services were down for two weeks, and we were wholly reliant on suppliers for identifying the root cause and fixing it. So what have we done in response to that? I've worked hard with colleagues to get ministers to understand the risk of relying on old, insecure technology. I have secured investment into our IT systems to make them more resilient and more secure. And as a result, we've built in-house teams, increased our capability and capacity. We have worked with suppliers like AWS to make MOJ's infrastructure more resilient and more secure. Out of our 34 most business critical system applications, 32 of those have been moved and are now hosted in the cloud. Brilliant, my job is done. However, the reality is that most of those applications are just a lift and shift. We've just moved existing code out of the applications and into the cloud. Don't get me wrong though, there are still benefits from a security perspective. 
so we still got the benefits of a reduced attack surface. We can detect threats and recover from them faster, but those applications are still legacy. What I want to do is work with all of you so that we don't take a ready-made solution and crowbar our legacy systems into them. I want to work collaboratively with you on problems from the start so we can get the right solution in place that can lead to greater possibilities. Wouldn't it be amazing if we had a solution where we could migrate and cleanse the data or start from scratch so that we can go after the bigger and better prize of automating our services. So we are on that journey in the Ministry of Justice. One of the goals of automating our services is to enable prisoners to do their own admin tasks from their cells with that technology that we are providing them. So that they can do simple things like ordering their lunch from their cell. And that may not sound that transformative to you, but from the user research we do with prison officers, they tell us that prisoners not knowing things like what they're having for lunch leads to violent behavior in the prisons. And so eliminating that risk means that the prison is a safer place to be and prison officers can spend their time on higher value tasks like education and resettlement. So I've set the context, I've explained what we're doing and the potential for future opportunities. And now I want to talk about another reason why it's paramount that we work together and why I love my job. And that's because it matters. In the Ministry of Justice, we handle data on some of the most vulnerable members of society at the most vulnerable point in their lives. It is vital that we protect their data. It's vital that they trust us to look after their data so that they can trust in the justice system. With services hosted in the cloud, there's a lot of assurance that that data is secure. But we all know that our systems are attacked on a daily basis and things go wrong. So what then? I say to my team, if you don't tell me about a problem, I can't help you solve it. I'm not a mind reader. So I put it to all of you. Let's increase transparency between us. Let's open up to better protect our data. And I'll give you a real life example. The Spectre attack a few years ago. One supplier called us up and said, we know about this, we're responding to it, this is the impact on MOJ and this is what we need you to do. Another supplier said, nothing to see here, we've got this. Now if you're me, faced with the responsibility of looking after all of that data on all of those vulnerable people, which approach would give you greater assurance? With the prolific use of technology in every part of society, I would argue it's even more important that we come together. I'm sure most of you would tell me that you don't have enough people with the right skills to protect the vast surface attack surface that we've got at the moment. Many people have said it throughout this conference, but I'm going to say it again. We need diversity of thought, we need diverse skill sets, and we need diverse experience to tackle the diverse challenges we all face. So in conclusion, let's not waste the resources we do have, reinventing the wheel, double triple checking assurances. As government security group says, let's defend as one. Let's collectively be that Roman tortoise shield around our systems, reducing the opportunity to exploit vulnerabilities. Let's increase transparency between us to protect against those pesky hackers as we are stronger when we work together. 
Thank you. Welcome to Cyber UK 2022. This is Plenary 4, the demand for supply chain, hosted by NCSC Deputy Director, Marsha Qualo wright Hi everyone, welcome to this session on the demand for supply chain. And this really feels like a year where supply chain has been a really hot topic. In fact, it seems that everyone is talking about supply chains. I'm going to start off by introducing a video from Jen Easterly, the director of the US Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, who sadly couldn't be with us today, but has sent us her opening remarks. I was at West Point on September 11, 2001 preparing to teach national security to cadets whose worlds were changed in an instant with the recognition that combat was likely in their near future. And just a few short years later, I found myself sitting behind my then boss, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, as she testified in front of the 9-11 Commission. I vividly recall the words of 9-11 co-chairman Tom Kane ringing in my ears even to this day. He said, on that September day, we were unprepared. We did not grasp the magnitude of a threat that had been growing for some considerable amount of time. This was a failure of policing, a failure of management, a failure of capability, but above all, a failure of imagination. Now, we together would do well to heed these words and remember that while history may not repeat itself, it surely does wrong. We cannot afford to suffer another colossal failure of imagination, and the stakes in the decade ahead could not be any higher, particularly for those of us in technology and cybersecurity. The balance of power and global governance, and even the future of global economic competitiveness, will all be significantly shaped in the immediate future. And at the core of this competition, I would argue, is technological innovation. Who will create the key technologies of the future? Who will make the rules for their use, ensuring fairness and equity and access by design? Who will ensure that they are secure? And who will train and retain the talent that will supercharge innovation for decades and centuries to come? The nation or the club of nations that drives the most technological innovation will, I would argue, hold a competitive edge that will impact every dimension of global society. You know, Einstein famously noted that imagination is more important than knowledge. And that's something that I've witnessed and experienced firsthand throughout my career, to include when I was in the Army and I served in Iraq in 2007. With terrorist violence at an all-time high, my team and I were deployed from the National Security Agency, charged with operationalizing a new high-technology platform known as Real-Time Regional Gateway, or RTRG, and it was a system designed to take all of our collection and theater and enrich it and correlate it and integrate it so that we could illuminate terrorist bomb-making networks, not in weeks or days, but in hours or minutes, and provide that intel into the hands of the operators so they could disrupt those networks. Now, sitting in the van in the middle of a base in Baghdad, our team was working to write the code to make that system run. And during that time, there were many, many small failures, but there was no failure of imagination. Indeed, there was a palpable presence of it. Uh, it was an environment of experimentation, collaboration, and entrepreneurship. And within weeks, we were able to provide a technology that would later be credited with taking thousands of terrorists off the battlefield and saving the lives of Iraqi civilians and coalition troops. And this experience was really an epiphany to me personally about the power of technology and imagination that when used together could produce incredible results and save lives. Now, as I said, that was 2007. And in retrospect, I've been struck by the other technological breakthroughs that occurred that same year. 
2007, of course, was the year that Steve Jobs introduced the world to the first iPhone, sparking a revolution in communications technology that has changed the way we all live and work. It was the same year that a small microblogging platform called Twitter began to spin off and scale globally, following in the footsteps of Facebook, which had just recently become available to anyone over the age of 13 with a valid email address. 2007 was the same year that development began on GitHub, the year that Hadoop emerged, the year Google launched Android and Amazon launched Kindle. It was the year that Intel first introduced non-silicon material into microchip, into microchips, which enabled the continued delivery, at least for the time, of the exponential growth in computing power as predicted by Gordon Moore in 1965. Now, perhaps most strikingly, 2007 was just 15 years ago. Think of how much has changed in our world as a result of these capabilities, which sprang from the imagination of some of our nation's most talented entrepreneurs. And what have we learned about the power and the misuse of technology during that time? And how will it inform the next 10 years and beyond? The emerging technology of today will define the shape of the world tomorrow. And it's not an exaggeration, in my view, to assert that the next 10 years could truly determine whether the liberal world order of the post-World War II period will survive. Or more optimistically, whether we as like-minded democratic nations will continue to thrive. Now just imagine some of our biggest challenges. Will we learn the lessons of the march to 5G telecommunications by investing early in emerging technologies that are foundational to our future? Or will we see to a reality in which authoritarian regime-linked firms become the center of gravity for innovating connectivity, setting global standards, patenting their tech, and progressively setting the telecom agenda of the future? Will we together define how powerful and yes, potentially dangerous technologies like facial recognition are developed and deployed? Or will we allow regimes with a penchant for using these technologies in anti-democratic ways set the rules? Will we be the first to develop a cryptographically relevant quantum computer? Or are we gonna lose a race that can threaten to unravel some of our most sensitive information? Will we develop and unleash the power of artificial intelligence for good spotting pathogens and blood samples, helping to predict emergencies before they happen? Or will we defer to governments that use these algorithms to develop things like social credit scores and manipulate information flow? Will we develop and effectively reclaim the promise of a single global internet, one that is truly open and fosters competition and privacy and respect for human rights, or are we truly doomed to manage an increasingly balkanized internet ecosystem in which millions or even billions of people are unable to communicate freely in a global commons? Will we lead on the development of smart tech and the growth of smart cities in a way that is not just secure by design, but engineered for privacy by design? Will we work together finally to lead the effort to shape the tech ecosystem to ensure that our software and our systems and our networks, and yes, the supply chains that underpin it all are secure and resilient by design so that a decade from now, a major intrusion or a new severe zero day vulnerability is the exception, not the norm. The answer to all of these questions can be, indeed, they must be yes. But only if we invest aggressively in our alliances, in our people, in global standards that reflect the core values that we hold dear across our nations and that bind us together. And it's why conferences like Cyber UK and more importantly, the conversations and the connections made here and the ideas discussed and debated here are so vital to our ability to imagine and reimagine and make real the collective cyber defense of our planet. Thanks again for the opportunity. Imagination, what a wonderful call to arms.
And as we're discussing the challenge of supply chain today, I'm going to put that to my panel, my wonderful panel, to bring a bit of imagination in your answers. <laughs> so that's my challenge to you today. I'm going to introduce the panel now. So first we have Brandon, Executive Director at CESA. We have Ben Ong, Chief Risk Officer at SAGE. Ian McCormack, Deputy Director for Government at NCSC. And on our video screen here, we have Jimmy Owens, Global CISO at DXC Technology. So I'm going to set out some questions to my panel, and we're going to have a discussion. So my first question, which I'm going to direct to Brandon, what are the key supply chain risks that we face now? What do you see as changing, and how is that affecting supply chain security? Sure, that's a, a fantastic way to start, because I think the challenges in the supply chain field are, are, are varied. Um, I'm thinking of kind of four big ones that I think really have gripped us over the past several years. Uh, one are the supply chain risks where you know what you're getting into and because they are buying into companies that are under the potential control of malicious actors, thinking Kaspersky, Huawei, where you're inviting into your supply chain potentially malicious actors. Um, second, uh, I would say something along the lines of the SolarWinds compromise from, from last year, where there are critical elements of, of in devices on your networks. Uh, that adversaries can adulterate because they understand how critical they are and maybe you haven't deployed the kind of protections needed to, to, to shore up your, your security. Third, uh, in the increasingly complex software development environment um, uh, where individual applications could be made up of hundreds of software libraries, any individual one of those could have a vulnerability in it, um, and we all experience this with the Log4j uh, the vulnerability in the Log4j library at the end of, at the end of last year. Um, and then finally, there is the challenge of the kind of complex software as a service uh, environment that we're all in, where many companies are investing in uh, using technology and using services, including managed service providers, uh, where adversaries can target those managed service providers, can target upstream in your supply chain to cause disruptions or to get inside of your network. Uh, you know, to that end, just a few hours ago, um, the Five Eyes Nations released an advisory for how to protect managed service providers uh, because we know adversaries are using that as a critical vector to, to get into, into inside of networks. Uh, so it provides advice for both MSPs for how to improve their security, uh, but more importantly, what do customers of those managed service providers do um, to make sure that they are hardening their interfaces with those MSPs uh, to safeguard their critical data and their critical systems. Great, thank you. And thinking about MSPs, I wonder if we want to see if um, Jimmy on the line wanted to add anything. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the big things uh, here at DXC, DXC Technology that we're looking at is really you know, to your point earlier about the supply chain and, and, and adversaries and, and nation states actually targeting MSPs to get a foothold into many of our clients. One of the big things is we're having the harder conversations with the, uh, the company CIOs, right? When you look at uh, from a security posture perspective, you know, we want to make sure that we, they understand the risk as well as we're translating the risk back to them to ensure that, you know, together, again, you know, uh, she said it earlier, the defendant is one team. Uh, one team, one fight, and together we win and together we lose, right? So we are having those harder conversations with some of our clients about increasing their security posture and how can we, how can we assist them in that as well. So thank you. Thank you. I love the one team approach. Um, Ian, did you want to add anything? Um, yes, um, brilliant. No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Marsha. And um, I very much agree with um, those remarks that, that, that you made there, Brandon. I mean, I think context is everything. The supply chain challenge is um, multifaceted, but clearly there is a strong focus on MSPs right now. And I think part of that focus on MSPs right now, if you think about some of the, um, you know, some of the, the challenges that presents us often, that relationship between MSPs and customers, it's one of high privilege, often a high privilege direct into, into our networks, our customer networks. Often those MSPs will have multiple customers. Usually they'll have multiple customers 
and you know sometimes as well I see that those relationships aren't quite on the radar of the network defenders and so you know you, you put those things together and I think this is some of the reason perhaps you know why we're seeing some of that increase in threat that's described in the um, in the advisory that we've um, just published together um, so I think that advisory is really you know is really powerful both in terms of illuminating the threat and also setting out um, the uh, a, a five eyes joint intent around the kind of mitigations that we're expecting to see being put in place. I mean, these, these won't be new mitigations. It's, it, it won't be a surprise to people. But actually, it's really powerful. I think that we're that we're you know we're, we're stating as a you know as a community that this is our, our expectation. And you know the the other thing that, that I love about the new guidance is that it presents this as a very much a joint responsibility. There is a there is a responsibility for consumers of the services as well as the MSPs themselves. So, okay. Great, Ben. The the only thing I would add is. I think it's important that we all recognise the economies of scale that are now available to bad actors. So you don't need to know, if you target a software library or an MSP or any other component of the supply chain, you don't need to know who might be affected or might be impacted or might be a valuable target for you. You can assume, you can assume it will be, you know, in today's interconnected world, you can assume there will be value in it. And so as a as a victim, you some, it's sometimes hard psychologically to understand that you're not actually maybe at the forefront of an attacker's mind in a supply chain attack. You're just, you, you know, it could be collateral damage or an unintended benefit. And I think when we appreciate, as I said, that, that um, those economies of scale from an attacker's perspective, actually you can, you can think about these risks in a slightly different way. So I think that, that would be the, you know, I think the, the, the standout point for me. So I've got a question for um, Ian, really, following on from the previous discussion. Can you provide some insight into recent significant supply chain incidents? And I'd also be keen to hear if you think our supply chains are becoming more vulnerable. Is the threat evolving? Right, thank you, Marsha. Um, there's, there's lots to pick from. <laughs> um, yeah, there's lots to pick from. And I think, I think there's, there's one or two you know, real key incidents that I think there's some lessons we can draw from them and illuminate some of the challenges we're up against. And, you know, I probably have to start at, at, at SolarWinds. You know, we've heard a lot about it so far this conference. I'm sure everybody is, you know, is aware of, of, of the background to that, compromised updates downloaded, um, essentially. And I think the thing that was really stark about this particular incident is the breathtaking scale of this. I mean, this was truly a global issue. Um, it was global action taken by an advanced actor to, you know, to achieve, you know, to achieve their aim. So, you know, there's something about this scale of that, which I think is something that we, you know, we nearly, really need to reflect on. The, the, the other point actually about solar winds, and I think this is a really sort of like powerful reminder, is well understood good practice would have helped protect organizations against the next stages of the attack. So I think, you know, we're talking about, you know, a very advanced actor, a very global incident, but in that particular one, um, those, those, those well understood mitigations would have, you know, would have offered protections. Um, and it's a bit like we've just been talking about MSPs where, you know, we've got another example there, I think, where, you know, from a threat point of view, you know, there's an opportunity there from the threat to take that sort of that one-to-many type approach, which, you know, which can affect us. Um, just a couple more I'd just briefly mention, if, 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 um, if I may. Um, I mean, Log4j, I mean, it's, 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 it's a vulnerability, but, you know, if, if you indulge me, um, I think that was a, you know, it was a bit of a wake-up call. Maybe it was another wake-up call, but <laughs> a wake-up call nonetheless um, to just how highly nested some of our technology services and systems are. Um, and I think, you know, there's a sort of you know, less, a lesson there that, that, you know, that level of diversity, that, that high level of nesting can make it incredibly difficult to, to actually understand what that supply chain looks like and therefore, you know, very difficult to understand and manage the risk. Um, the final example I just give, because I think this is a really good, you know, a good reminder as well, is that when we're talking about supply chain security, it's not just about technology organizations and, and, and cyber, actually. It's, it's parts of the supply chain that, maybe you know have been under the cyber radar and you know i think a great example was um back in 2019 with a with the ransomware incident that affected eurofins and you know that had real impact into the whole criminal justice system but you know it probably wasn't really on the you know on the sort of you know, the cyber radar so we need to think about you know all of those you know all of, all of that sort of dependency um if you like brandon have the wake-up calls that ian has um, outlined <laughs> felt the same in the u.s no i i, I think um, absolutely. You know, I think if you look at the string of cyber incidents that we experienced starting in 2020 and then now more recently with the, the, the threat posed by, by Russia in the wake of its, of its further invasion of Ukraine, um, 
and I think the, the thread that I kind of pull through all of it is the exploitation of trust. In that in modern, complex environments, your systems are set up to, Im to implicitly trust other parts of the network. I mean, that is ultimately what supply chain attacks are. They're going after those trusted relationships between you and your vendor, you and your supplier, you and your software, software inside of your network, trusting each other, and they're exploiting it. Um, and so it puts the burden on those network defenders to understand what kind of trust-based relationships they think they need to have inside of their environment and how best to secure and improve those. Um, and it's, it, is, it is challenging because it is, software is more complex today, the relationships are more complex, the technology between yourselves and MSPs and clouds, et cetera, and how you authenticate and identity management, all of those are trust-based relationships. All of those are the, are the target of our adversary. Um, and we need to, as community, think about how do we improve our security in those trust-based environments. Brilliant. And how does it feel in Sage? Well, we're a, we're a software company, so Log4j was a, you know, was a, was a, a challenging uh, time, uh, as it was for many organisations. I mean, what, what was really interesting, well, not interesting, terrifying to me about Log4j was that I think we and other companies were seeing attacks in the wild literally minutes after the vulnerability was um, disclosed. And if you think about that, you know, the turnaround time, and I don't know the ins and outs of it, but the turnaround time for attackers is, you know, faster than the turnaround time for defenders in terms of the response. And, you know, that uh, imbalance, you know, uh, extrapolated across, you know, the internet and, and the, you know, the supply chain is, you know, is a real problem. And I think, um, you know, our ability to assume that these things will happen or our, uh, and then and, and put in place not just the preventative measures, but our response measures to try and, you know, bridge that gap, um, you know, or that, to take away that advantage that maybe the attacker has is really important and was a, was a really a big wake-up call for me. And Jimmy, do you see that same imbalance um, from an MSP's perspective? We, we do. And I'll tell you, one of the big, uh, the most frustrating thing uh, for myself as having one of the, uh, as being one of the security leaders at DXC was, you know, the state of influx, right? Uh, originally, you know, Intel came out, you should upgrade it to 216, then they said to go to 217. Then they said versions one are not vulnerable if you set this flag, uh, Java 6, Java 7, Java 8. It just seemed to be all over the place initially, right? So. You know, we were retouching and touching folks, uh, both in the internal perspective as well as our customers. And, and I'll be very honest with you, it, it was very enduring for the folks that were managing um, uh, the incident for us. Uh, you know, when I look at uh, from an intelli you know, intelligence perspective, getting the right intelligence, you know, it, it just seems for this one, you know, with SolarWinds, I get it. SolarWinds was very, you know, if you had SolarWinds, you were in the mix. Log4j, as you said earlier, Log4j was in everything. This was one of the worst ones, you know, and I'm hoping, as everybody has said before, we always say this, this is the worst one, but it just seems that there'll be one right down the road from now, right? Uh, but again, for us, it was really just not getting the correct information, you know, from, from the supply chain vendors on what version to move to. So, you know, touching, you know, at DXC, we have a ton of clients asking them to go, you know, are you running version one? Set this flag. Uh, okay, Java 6, go to Java 7, 7, go to 216, go to 218, excuse me, 217. So I think there was a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, confusion on, on where you should end up at. So that was tough for us. And you've hit my imagination point because now I'm sitting here imagining what the worst thing is going to come next <laughs> after Log 4J. Um, my next question is, um, I'm going to start with Ben. How should we expect suppliers to manage their own risk profiles and discharge those risks responsibly? Yeah, it's really, it's really tough. The, you know, we're a, like, I guess many people in the room, we're a consumer and, and a supplier of services. And, you know, in that sense, just a cog in a huge and un unknowable machine. And, you know, I think exchanging security questionnaires with each other um, it, with generic um, questions uh, is not probably a sustainable or effective way of managing that risk. For, for me, I think about what are the, the leading indicators of trust and reliability 
in an organization that we want to work with or wants to work with us, I guess. And, you know, for a big organization like Sage, that could be, you know, how effective are we at identifying and responding to vulnerabilities in our technology stack? For a smaller organization, one of the small businesses that maybe that we serve, it could be, um, you know, how well have they distributed their security problems ac across their, their own supply chain, you know, with the big cloud providers or, or, or some of the technology tools they use. And that's very, it's a very different, those are very different sort of answers so that aren't going to be surfaced in a, in a questionnaire. And I think, you know, to, to my earlier point about Log4j, you know, the thing that matters most to me in our supply chain and matters most to me in terms of when we're dealing with our customers is transparency and responsiveness because if you assume that things are going to go wrong, you are going to have incidents and problems, you know, it's, you know there's, there's no absolutes in security, then your ability to communicate early and um, uh, 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 clearly and honestly with your customers and, and similarly with your own supply chain is critical because then you can collectively start managing those risks, whether they're data regulatory risks, whether they're availability um, uh, risks uh, together, rather than, you know, the worst, the worst thing in the world is when, you know, one of, part of the supply chain has an incident and you don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the absolute worst place to be. And so I think that, that transparency and response um, piece is going to be in increasingly important, I think, in terms of how we manage these risks, you know, as a collective. And transparency is another one of those themes that I've seen come up throughout Cyber UK and how important it is for us to help tackle some of these really big challenges that we're facing. Um, Jimmy, does it feel similarly for you as you're, again, in the position of both being a customer and a supplier? Yeah, you know, a absolutely. And, and you, you, I think you, you nailed the, 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 the saying throughout the whole conference, which is transparency, right? So as, as both a consumer and a supplier, you know, for us, you know, when I look at third party risk management and fourth party risk management, those are big topics for, for many of the regulated industries. And you start looking at the questionnaires and, and as he stated earlier, those are point in times, right? At the end of the day, you need to have that solid trust relationship. You know, one of the big things that uh, we believe in uh, is that uh, the full transparency on if you start to see something say something, right, from an indicators of compromise, IOCs, share those IOCs with your, with, your, with your clients, right, as well as the supply chain. You know, we are also a consumer of uh, some very large products and we, we, we sell those back to our clients. And, and we've established those trust relationships that, you know, give us a call when you see something. Let us know ahead of time. And, and I understand from a, a regulatory and, and legal perspective, there's, there's so much they can share. But we do press on many of our, our, our major suppliers to, to, to have that communication and that trust between the two of us. And, and that goes back to not just from a, a supply chain management perspective, but also with the federal governments, right? The government regulatory bodies, you know, sharing that information across as well. Because the quicker we can get the information, the quicker we can hunt and share with our clients as well. So, yes, we do see the same. Great. Thank you. And, Ian, it'd be interesting to have your perspective from a government point of view yeah thank you I mean and, and the question was you know about responsibility and I think you know the first thing that we need to do is we need to be really clear about where are those those responsibilities um, uh, held I mean there's a there's a really well-known concept of the shared responsibility model for security you know we talk about it in in cloud um, but actually I think it applies in this sort of context as well where you know we need to understand you know, what, what are we responsible for as consumers what are the suppliers responsible for and then with that understanding, then, you know, the, the, the notion of transparency, I think, is really important here. You know, we need transparency on how those responsibilities are, are discharged. I think there's another point that, that I'd like to make as well from um, the, sort of, you know, the point of view of, of those consuming those kind of services and that, you know, we can transfer responsibility for delivering a security outcome to a supplier, but we can't transfer the ownership of the risk if that responsibility isn't discharged correctly because you know that is still felt within our organization so you know we need to really understand that and at the executive level in organizations that are consuming those services I think we need to understand that as well I would just make one final point actually as you know if, if, if might as well um, in terms of sort of the responsibilities and you know we're talking here about you know the kind of things that we we would expect suppliers you know particularly MSPs to be putting in place but the other dimension to this as well and I, you know I really passionately believe that MSPs suppliers are also part of the solution you know particularly 
when we're talking about some of the capabilities and the ability to, you know, to, to, to draw inference from data and to be able to have tooling to be able to make you know, sort of those rapid decisions a bit like you know, you're referring to there, Ben, we need to respond really quickly as, as network defenders as well. So you know, it's part of the solution as well, I think. Brandon, I saw you nodding at, at some points there. So I think. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to, I think one important distinction is between the ability of large companies with more sophisticated operations to be able to understand and manage their, their third party risk um, and, the, and the responsibility that should be on uh, critical suppliers, cloud managed service providers, et cetera, when engaging with small and medium sized businesses the ability to make security easier for those companies to deploy and ensure they understand uh, their obligations in that environment I think is so important. Particularly, you know, as, as the Chancellor this morning was discussing the, the risks of ransomware, et cetera, that are directly going after those, uh, those organizations that don't have the level of sophistication in cybersecurity. It puts a burden on those companies that are providing them kind of critical services, critical suppliers, if they're enabling their operations in, in the cloud, making that security architecture easier to implement, easier to operate, and easier to understand when that risk is changing. Um, I think that kind of paradigm really needs to, to, to expand. And my next question is, um, I'm going to go to Jimmy first. How do we incentivize the supply chain and the broader market to address some of these security considerations by default? So, so I'm going to take a little bit different approach here versus incentivize. Uh, I, I'm going to look at penalties, right? So I, 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 some people may be shaking their head, oh, what, what's he about to say? You know, when, when I look at a new vehicle, for instance, an automobile, right, and I purchase a new car, there's an expectation that uh, if I drive that vehicle off the lot that I have the safety features. So when I look at uh, supply chain vendors today, you know, building applications and software and things of that sort, my expectation is they're doing the right thing. And they're, you know, from a security perspective, they're doing the right code certifications, things of that sort, ensuring that the, and, and also, right, if you think about it, you know, the nation states and the threat actors out there, if they can figure out the holes and exploits, you know, why can't companies do the same thing? You know, there's this term called cost of doing business. And to me, from my perspective, I think companies really need to take the accountability and build that into the, you know, cost of doing business and add some additional security folks to start certifying their code, as well as uh, from a maintenance perspective. Again, you know, when you start looking at, you know, from a regulatory perspective, uh, like the automobile industry, uh, it's regulated, right? From a safety perspective, they have to go through a number of checks. Today, it's wild, wild west. You can build an application with no accountability, for instance, SolarWorks, Log4j. Uh, if, if ransomware, and again, Going back to the whole ransomware as a service, it's commoditized today. Anybody can buy it for pennies on the dollar today. Uh, if they can find an exploit, they can drop the malware. Now you have a ransomware event and, and millions of dollars, as, as, as she said, alluded to earlier, $2.2 .2 million, I thought she said was an average ask from a ransomware perspective. So I, I just think we need to really make these software vendors as well as supply chain folks like MSPs more accountable, uh, both from a financial perspective. Thank you. Brandon. Yeah, no, that's, again, if, if someone had the answer here, we would already be doing it. Um, uh, so this is one where we're going to need some of that innovation. We're going to need some more creative thinking. I, I think we are moving into an environment where customers are growing more savvy uh, in terms of what their expectations are of their upstream and downstream uh, connections. But that needs to become uh, more consistent. Uh, and, and I think customers need to hold their supply chains accountable uh, for the security outcomes that are being delivered. Um, and at that point, that's going to be the biggest incentive to, to driving the market, to building in security up front, delivering security by design. Um, and without that, I think you will still, we will still run into these same challenges that we're running into today. And do you think we need to educate the customers to be asking those questions? I think that is, you know, why the, you know, why we are issuing advisories like we do that provide clear guidance to customers in terms of if you're using a managed service provider, here is the things that you need to ask for. Here are the things you need to ensure on your side, um, and these are the conversations you need to have with your with your provider. Um, but, you know, advisories are good, but getting that last mile where the customer is actually taking action uh, is is where we're at right now. Ben, I'm interested in having your perspective on this as well. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Jimmy, actually. And I think, you know, 
small and medium-sized companies that work with Sage, they don't want or need to know the ins and outs of our security program. This is just table stakes, but they don't want to think about security. They, they're, just, they're, just, they're just, you know, to the analogy about the car, they just want it out of the box. And I think, you know, the, the more we s stop thinking about this as a nice to have and just, you know, you know to Jimmy's point, the cost of doing business, I think, and, um, you know, that's both a kind of mindset and expectation and probably, you know, to some degree, a kind of regulatory or a legal uh, responsibility, then I, then I think, we, you know, we're not going to solve it, but we'll go a long way towards, you know, being in a better position. Ian. I, mean, I think on this, I mean, I really believe in the power of transparency. And I think this is so much more powerful than, than a standard or a compliance. And, you know, and if we can encourage the market to properly value security, to, 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 to ask for it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that can be well understood and, um, and, and clearly articulated, and then transparency will, um, will lead, to, I believe, to incentives in the market. Brilliant. Well, I'd like to really thank my wonderful panel. Um, we've had some, a great conversation, and the things that I'm going to take away from this are imagination, <laughs> transparency, and um, ownership. Um, that's definitely what I've taken. So thank you, everyone, and thank you to Jimmy on the line. <laughs>